Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out, um, and thank you for finding the new venue. Um, but we're extremely uh, honoured tonight to have Dr. Heidi Hamill, and, and when I was doing my research, um, yeah, there, there was no problem finding uh, a lot of exciting things that Heidi's done over her career, some of which we're, we're going to hear about tonight. But uh, Dr. Heidi Hamill is the Executive Vice President of the Association of Universities for Research in Astronomy and they coordinate a huge number of activities, some of which you'll no doubt be familiar with, things like the Hubble Space Telescope. It's a very high profile kind of like multi-university activities. Um, she has a, a fairly excellent <coughs> record working for places like NASA and MIT. Um, but when I asked her just before this, well, what drives you to do this? And I was expecting some life-changing story. And, and I mean, it's certainly a life-changing story. You only have to read the, the bio to discover that. But what drives Heidi is the joy of discovery, of finding new things. And I thought, well, that's just about the best answer. Um, because hopefully that, that's what's driving all good science. And, and it's sort of that, that joy of discovery that's very important to, um, I guess, convey to the next generation and to convey to the general public. Um, which is something that Heidi does an awful lot of. Uh, she has a raft of awards for public engagement. She, she deserves another little extra award for coming along here tonight, um, including things in the New York Times, in Newsweek, in the Oprah magazine, so really reaching out to the, the broadest uh, possible section of the community, as well as awards from um, the Carl Sagan Award and from the Exploratorium, which is one of the, the most world-renowned science centres um, anywhere in the world, actually. Um, she feels a real obligation that if the community are funding this kind of research, then scientists actually have an obligation to report what's happening. As a science communicator myself, I thought that was a, a particularly inspiring answer. Um, I won't um, steal Heidi's thunder on what she's going to speak to us about tonight, but it is about um, the impact. I, um, on Jupiter, and tonight I think we have Anthony Westley in the audience, do we? I, I'm going to make an example of you, <laughs> Anthony, because it's a, a fantastic example of, I guess, um, you know, university-based science working um, with amateur, but obviously extremely talented uh, astronomers, and, and really coming up with groundbreaking discoveries. So I think we should have a, a little clap for Anthony. <laughs> Because without his contribution, we might not be hearing this talk tonight. Um, and just before we kick off, I'd like to say a big hello to people at Ballarat Observatory, which uh, they are here with us on the internet, and apparently they can see us all. So in that um, spirit of community, can we all give them a wave? Come on. Right? I hope the technology is working. <laughs> apparently they can see us. If you can see us, I... I hope that meant a lot. But look, I won't be you any longer. I, I just wish I could see you back. That, that's, that's all I can say. But I think we should hand over to Heidi. Let's make you feel very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I want to give some acknowledgement to some people who, who contributed quite a bit to the presentation that I'm going to give to you tonight. Uh, Clark Chapman, David Morrison, and Mark Boslow. Uh, Here's an outline of what we're going to talk about today. First, we're going to talk about Jupiter and me and how I ended up looking at Jupiter. And then, and for those of you who are not internet savvy, the next thing is, oh my god. Then, seriously? <laughs> then we'll do a reality check and we'll wrap it all up at the end. So let's talk about Jupiter and me and how I ended up uh, being in charge of all these comet crash observations. My interactions with Jupiter started with this picture of Jupiter was taken in March of 1993. And for those of you who don't recognize it, that's Jupiter. This is not one of the best pictures of Jupiter ever taken. In fact, it was a pretty awful picture of Jupiter. But the, Jupiter was not the most important thing in this picture. This was the most important thing in the picture. And if you can't make that out very well, here are some other images of it. What this was, was a comet that had been captured by Jupiter's gravitational pull and was in orbit around Jupiter. And it got a little too close to Jupiter and got pulled apart. And then the next time we tracked its orbit very carefully and we knew that this comet was going to collide with Jupiter. That was known from tracking its orbit. 
Um, here's a Hubble Space Telescope image of the fragments. And let me turn off the lights so you can see it a little better. Hold on. I got training in this. <laughs> How's that? A little better? Yeah. All right. So we, being scientists, named the individual fragments very creatively. <laughs> you notice that some of the letters are bigger than others because those are brighter fragments, and therefore we assume they are larger pieces of the comet. Um, this was a comet because it was fuzzy in the sky. Uh, you'll notice that some of them have double letters because those comet pieces actually broke up after the comet was discovered. All right, so we named a fragment P, but then it then started to move. If you look closely, you'll see that there's some things missing. Some letters missing. I, J, O, N. Well, I and O we deliberately left off because they look like ones and zeros, so we didn't want to be confused. But M and J actually were there when they were named, and then they dissipated uh, by the time that this particular image was taken. And I also want to ask, I like to ask people, why do you think the comet is red and yellow? in this picture. Any guesses? <coughs> Hot? All right, a comet is made of ice. It's a ball of ice. So it's not because it's hot. Any other guesses? Uh, infrared image, that's a good guess. People told me that this group would be really sharp. But that's not the answer. It's a visible light image. What? Elements, yeah, potassium, sodium, good guess, no. <laughs> the answer is it's colorized red because the guy who made the picture thinks it looks prettier. <laughs> That's the only reason it is red. Comets are actually balls of ice, dirty ice. What color is dirty ice? You get snow here? Yeah, it's like gray, right, gray, brown. That's what this actually looks like, but it's colorized this way so that when you want to put it on the cover of the New York Times, it looks really cool. <laughs> All right, so whenever you see pictures like that, you know, don't get misled. All right, so let's move on. Now, people have predictions of what would happen. You guys in Australia should be happy that it would only have caused a U.S. ice age. <laughs> I don't know. That actually didn't happen. But in fact, we did know that it was going to hit Jupiter. And so every telescope on Earth and in space was going to be pointed at Jupiter when this comet crashed into it in 1994. Now, the reason I got involved is because I was at MIT at the time, and the fellow down the hall from me at MIT was an atmosphere theorist. And he put together this theory of what would happen. And his theory said there, after the impacts occurred, there'd be these rings, like ripples in a pond. And I said, really? He said, yeah, I'm sure we're going to see this with Hubble. You have to help me write an observing proposal. And I had never used Hubble, but I had written a lot of observing proposals. So I said, sure, I'll help write you a proposal. And so I wrote a proposal, and I sent it in with all the other proposals that went in. And I got a phone call in January of 1994, and they said, we have selected your proposal. I thought, oh, that's great. And they said, we have also decided that we're going to take all the seven proposals that we got and put them together into one thing, and we want you to lead the team. <laughs> <laughs> now, I never looked at Jupiter before. And I think that was why. Because the other people were experts in Jupiter, and I think they thought maybe they'd use the, the, the authority to do their own special science with Jupiter, whereas I had no horse in the race. Because I studied Neptune. I didn't know anything about Jupiter. So that's how I got to be the team leader. And when we were in the control room down in the basement of Space Telescope Science Institute, I got to sit in the front row, because I was the team leader. And we got amazing images. And many of you have seen some of these images. Um, this is a little time sequence from the very first impact, where you see this massive plume. Let me give you a sense of scale. This is sticking out 5,000 kilometers above the cloud tops of Jupiter. And then when it rotated into view, this is one of the impact sites. And we'll come back to this one later. This was the G impact. If you recall, G was a big letter. It was a big impact. Um, and as time went on, the winds of Jupiter were smearing these things out. All right. 
So there's a few takeaway lessons. It was an absolutely fabulous tracer of circulation in Jupiter's atmosphere. Normally in astronomy, we don't get to interact with our test subjects. We just look at what's going on. But this is a case where nature injected dye into the atmosphere of this planet. And we were able to track the dye as, as it moved through the atmosphere. And it allowed us to trace atmospheric circulation in a way that we could never, ever have done in any other way. So we learned a lot about the circulation of the atmosphere of Jupiter. We also learned a lot about large explosions. And some of the people who were most interested in the comet crash were the people who model extremely large explosions, nuclear bomb explosions. And they can't do those tests anymore because it's not allowed by international treaty. So this was their opportunity to actually have models of real, real world explosions to test their models against. And there were actually some very surprising results. And you can ask me about that during Q&A if you want. I'd be happy to share with you some of the surprising results where we've actually, you know, when I give this talk in the US, I say, well, we're enhancing US national security. <laughs> I can't really say that here for you, but you, know, you should be happy that the US national security is enhanced, I guess. <laughs> Another really important aspect of this was we showed in 1994 that the solar system is still a dynamic place. Things change. Big things change. There are cosmic collisions going on. And you know we know that. I mean, I bet a lot of people in this room have actually seen a cosmic collision. Have any of you ever seen a shooting star? All right? You have seen a piece of a comet or an asteroid hitting the Earth's atmosphere. Small piece, not big like these, but you've seen a cosmic collision. But I'm going to talk some more about some really big collisions. Now, how often do these things happen? You know, after SL9 in 1994, people did a lot of thinking and a lot of modeling, a lot of studies, and they, there was a paper published saying how often they happen. And for relatively <coughs> small fragments, those little letters, every 500 years or so, for big ones like Shoemaker 9, every 6,000 years or so. So I'm like, wow, I was really lucky to be the one who got to watch this one. It only happens every hundreds or thousands of years, right? Well, let's fast forward 15 years to Anthony, who, with his own telescope, right here in Australia, in Moore Bateman, actually, which is very close by, he comes up one day and finds this spot on Jupiter. And what I want to do now is show you my life, the next 26 hours of my life, after Anthony discovered this feature, just so you know how these things really work. All right, so there's a little timeline going to go up here. All right, so 2 o'clock Eastern U.S. time is when the, we think the impact actually happened. And I think, Anthony, you actually saw it, but how many? Oh, midnight local time. Midnight local time, which is how many hours after oh, the impact? That's like um, six or seven. Six or seven hours after this, he saw it, all right? Email starts flying around the amateur community, and it was around um, 8 in the evening on my time, no, 11.30 my time, where an amateur astronomer emailed me. Just out of the blue, and I was up, because I have three kids, all right? So I was up at 11.30 at night, and you see, here's an image of a probable comet impact on Jupiter, uh, discovered by Anthony Wesley. It's as dark as a moon shadow, but the wrong shape, and not when any shadows are predicted. On the other hand, I was imaging the same hours, area eight hours earlier and got nothing. So that was my first hint that something was going on at 11.30 at night. And so I started Googling, what else are you going to do and at 11.30 at night? And so I, you know, I started seeing all these amateur reports about this. So I emailed Amy Simon Miller. You'll notice it's now 1.30 in the morning. I haven't gone to bed yet. So Amy is a scientist at the Goddard Space Flight Center. My last images of Jupiter were in 1994 that Amy had been actually doing real science using the Hubble Space Telescope looking at Jupiter since then. 
So I emailed Amy, if this is real, do you want to collaborate on the Hubble director's discretionary request? We asked the director, please give us time. Um, I'm not sure yet whether I believe it or not, but it is quite dark. Morphology's not convincing. Sorry, Anthony. But that's where Hubble may help. Your experience with Hubble Jupiter imaging is more recent than mine. What do you think? And then I went to bed because I figured if this was real, I wasn't going to get a lot of sleep for a while. So in the middle of the night, I had got this. When I woke up, there was an email from Glenn Horton, who was an astronomer at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, to Augustine Sanchez La Vega, an astronomer in Spain, and CCing Amy and I. Um, I'll see what happens when you see us over Mauna Kea. He was observing at NASA's infrared telescope. I'm copying this to Amy and Heidi. Any chance of mounting a very rapid Hubble director's discretionary type proposal? I'll try to verify tonight the IOTF, but it looks like Jupiter may have been hit again. So when I woke up, I wrote, Glenn, I'm already a few hours ahead of you on that. <laughs> I contacted Amy last night. Any chance I could get coordinates or predicted central meridian longitude transit times for the next few days? I've also alerted Imka the Potter at Berkeley. She has Keck time with the laser guide star uh, the night after tomorrow. And Imka and I had actually planned Jupiter observations for the day after this at the Keck Observatory in Hawaii. All right, so now look at the time, right? So now the time advance is about six minutes. I got this message from Glenn. It's near 300 degrees west in System 3 longitude, observing now, more later. Now, <laughs> Anthony knows Glenn, and I know Glenn. Glenn is one of these people. <laughs> yeah, chat, chat, chat. And when I got this email, I'm like, I know Glenn's working really hard. There must be something going on. <laughs> so I emailed Matt Mountain, the director of Space Telescope, Ben, two minutes later, saying, Matt, community is a buzz with possible impact on Jupiter. People have already asked me about possible director's discretionary time for Hubble images. I'm contacting you to see if we can do that. Glenn's gearing up with IRTF, yada, 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 yada. All right. So then after I sent that email to Matt, this is what I wrote to Glenn. The question is, do you really think it's an impact? Is it hot? It's certainly dark. But morphology in one image, not conclusive. I don't want to mount a huge effort if it's just a regular Jovian dark spot. Then I get this message from Glenn, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> Super bright near two microns and ammonia emission at 9.8 microns. This is what he was seeing at the telescope. Okay? So then, then I get a t a, this message from a reporter at Science Magazine. It's only 8.20 something in the morning. And the reporters, this just came in a Twitter email to HBH, an impact or just a brown spot. So already the reporters are calling me, asking me, and I don't even know what's going on yet. But you know, we're making it up as we go along, because that's what we do. <laughs> then Augustine emails Amy and Glenn and I saying, attached is the message we've just sent to the Spanish observatories in the Canary Islands of Color Alto with our predictions for the next transit, when it's going to be visible. Um, at the International Outer Planet Watch, we have received additional images. We're navigating them now, so I think we'll have better predictions for tomorrow. So things are really rolling along here, and it's only 9 in the morning. All right. A uh, little time goes by. I emailed to all those people, including Infant the Potter. I said, um, Amy and I have the Hubble proposal in the works. I have alerted Inca for the Keck Observatory tomorrow night. I also will contact Doug. He is the director of the Gemini Observatory. I go offline at 11.15 Eastern for a few hours. Children have to go to the orthodontist and the doctor. Too hard to reschedule. Anybody who's a parent out there, you know what I'm talking about. You don't blow off the orthodontist. All right. So then I emailed, just before I go to the orthodontist, I emailed Doug. I said, Doug, you may have heard about this event in Jupiter, yada, yada. We request director's discretionary time on Gemini, yada, yada. Then I go off to the orthodontist. So Matt Mountain, director of Space Health, so calls me on the phone in the orthodontist's office. <laughs> so I'm sitting there, my, my child, and, uh, and I'm talking on the phone. You really want to do this, Heidi? You know what's at stake here? You know, you know, you, know, you understand this? I'm like, yeah, I understand the whole thing. Because I did. I knew what he was going through. It was really awful. <laughs> 
But then, you know, after our conversation, he emailed the rest of the Hubble team, just got off the phone to Heidi, clearly she would like to do this and would like the UV and blue filters. She has promised to send in a DD proposal today. She understands the constraints we are operating under. Now I want to show you the constraints that we're operating under. This was in the middle of the summer. Hubble had just been serviced in May by the astronauts. Seven astronauts had just risked their lives to go up and service Hubble and put in all new instruments. After they put in new instruments, they have a period of time that they call the servicing mission verification period. Small, all right. Servicing mission orbital verification. This is a plan, and I had seen this plan beforehand. I knew this plan. Um, the black is the planned observations. This was the servicing mission, and then this period of time that you can see there from the middle of May through June, July, August, September. This is when they're checking out the instruments that have just been installed on the telescope. They're checking out the new advanced camera for surveys. They're checking out the imaging spectrograph. They're checking out the new UV channels, the infrared cameras, the new cosmic origin spectrograph. They're going through and putting everything through its paces to make sure everything works. And then the red stuff up there, EROs, Early Release Observations. These are the observations that the teams who built that equipment planned for years to do, to take the most beautiful images so that they would get the fabulous publicity that Hubble deserves. Nowhere <laughs> on there does it say, look at an impact on Jupiter. <laughs> so it's huge. This is a very choreographed thing. And you don't just interrupt it. But we did. <laughs> and it was not easy. Um, here's what Matt then went on to say. She understands the constraints we are operating under and that we are separating the issue of getting the data from how and when we release the data. Because that was a huge political issue, a contractual issue. Lawyers were involved. And it had to go all the way to the head of NASA, who Charlie Golden had to sign off on us changing the plan to take the observations. But we did. We agreed it was too important an event to pass up on. Thanks. <laughs> so Mike Wong, then it's 3 o'clock. Now it's been just 24 hours since the impact. Less than 24 hours since Anthony saw the impact. Mike Wong sends me a note and says, and he's at Space Telescope, he says, hi, everyone. He says everything is due in one hour. <laughs> like, ah, OK. I know we'll be the PI, we'll submit to phase one. And then 4.15 PM, so it's 26 hours and 15 minutes from impact, our submitted phase one director's discretionary time proposal is attached. There it is. <laughs> so that is how you get from the detection here in Australia to 26 hours later, Hubble, Keck, Gemini are all online and ready to look at the impact site. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was what my life was like on that day. All right. So this is the impact. This is the actual press release. Um, the oh, OK. Well, then we won't be able to see very well. They can't see me or the slides? They can't see both. So sorry. Put them on and we'll see. Most of it's pretty bright. This is the impact site. This is a Hubble image, so you can see a lot of the detail in there. How's that working for you guys? OK, good. Right. Now, here's some results that Augustin, remember the picture, he's from Spain, showed, one of the first questions people asked us was, is this just a piece of SL9 that missed Jupiter and came around again? And so what we determined for this impact is the entry was coming from that direction and being ejected in that way, whereas in shoemaker Levy 9 it was coming from the south and being ejected that way. And there's no way that it could have changed its orbital direction. So it's very clear this was not a piece of SL9 that missed. It was a different thing entirely. Um, here are some Hubble images. 
showing the e evolution of that impact site from the top where you first saw it further on down. And that is just due to the winds of Jupiter spreading it around. Now some people said, look at those dark clumps in there. You know, does that, does that mean that you know, maybe it was more than one thing going in? So we looked at that, and uh, we'll come back to that in a second, um, <coughs> about this clumpiness. So that's, the, that's uh, this impact, 2009. In fact, here's an example of something we saw in 1994, the H impact site. And it looks clumpy too, right? But that's all due to the winds. When this feature started, it was a tight feature. And we actually watched as this material got sucked up into this Jovian vortex. So this clumpiness, we're pretty sure, is actually just due to Jupiter's winds stirring up this black stuff. And what is that black stuff anyway? It's black clouds. When, this, when these fragments hit Jupiter, they're coming in at a very high velocity, and they cause large explosions. And the explosions turn into basically soot, which rains down in the atmosphere, making black stuff in the atmosphere. And so that's what this black stuff is. It's not holes in the clouds. It's black material, that black soot. So these are similar to one another, but there were differences between shoemaker Levy 9 and this 2009 impact. So let me just show you several of the differences. All right. First of all, for shoemaker Levy 9 we saw a lot of, of halos. If you look up there in the UV, that top row is ultraviolet, you see how that's fuzzy? around it, it's sort of like a kind of a blobby sort of nature. When we looked in the 2009 data, we didn't see that. Um, in 2009, um, the, the UV data looked just like the visible data. So there, we, the way we interpret that is we know for a fact, for shoemaker Levy 9 that it was a comet fragment surrounded by debris, like dust. And this is a piece of evidence suggesting there wasn't a lot of dust surrounding whatever that object was. All right, so it didn't have a coma like a comet. It was see this evidence is that it was a solitary body. Okay, so another piece of evidence comes from how long this stuff lasted. This is 1994, and the the sequence from top to bottom is something like 11 days. And this dip is how dark the impact site was. And you see from the top to the bottom, it stayed dark for like 10 days, at least 10 days, in 94. But in 2009, the impact site faded away within 10 days. And the way we interpret this is we suggest well, maybe these are heavier pieces that precipitate out of the atmosphere so you don't see them anymore. Whereas in shoemaker Levy 9, it was fine dust that hung around. Circumstantial, we don't know for sure, but that's one way to interpret this data. Okay, so suggested that there are heavier particles in the newer 2009 impact. Here's another interesting piece of evidence. For shoemaker Levy 9, every time one of those fragments went in, there was a big blip in the radio emission from Jupiter. And so that was interpreted as saying, the radio emission comes from the magnetic field, the particles bouncing around the magnetic field. And so every time one of these comet fragments went through, it disrupted the bouncing of these particles, and that gave us a radio signal. There was no radio signal for the 2009 impact. Again, suggesting it was not a big coma of dust, but some very small single body. And finally, um, what this is, is uh, infrared spectroscopy from the Gemini telescope, and this red line is silicate emission that was not seen in shoemaker Levy 9 the Silicate emission says to us, rock. Not ice, but rock. So any one of these lines of evidence taken by itself is weak, but when you put all four lines of evidence together, that really suggests to us that the 2009 impact was probably an asteroid and not a comet, a single rock that hit the planet. So all of those four things that I just talked about. It was a second <laughs> once in a lifetime event. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> all right. It was distinct from SL9. And it actually had people starting to think, well, gosh, what did we do wrong in that paper? You know, we're in 1997 where we said it was 
you know, once in a once in a lifetime. Well, clearly, it's not once in a lifetime. And guess what? The next year, we are third at once in a lifetime event. Um, and it's funny about this one is that the previous one we had written all our work up and it was in press and we had the proofs when we had this event come in. We're like, oh. so we add a line, you know, <laughs> to the bottom of the paper saying, oh, by the way, there is yet another impact on Jupiter. Now this one was detected by Anthony again and another fellow, Christopher Go, and it's a video, their video sequences, two different ones here from two different telescopes, and I don't know which one's yours, Anthony. Can you tell by looking? Uh, no idea. No, it's one or the other. I think the top one's mine. Mine was red light. This was blue light. I think the top one's the top Okay. So this, this is a little video sequence showing this thing getting brighter and then disappearing. So we again commandeered all the large telescopes and we looked. And if you look at those boxes, that's where that bright flash occurred. You don't see anything. So what that was, was a shooting star on Jupiter. But it, did, it was not big enough to make a big impact site. It just burned up as it went in but it didn't leave any impact site. So now we know when we see these flashes, we now know if it is only this bright, we don't commandeer the big telescopes anymore. <laughs> you know, and all the directors of the big telescopes are very happy about that. Uh, and it's good. It's good, to, it's good to know because you know, we can now constrain whether or not we ask for time. And it's also good for the people who to like to do the models of these things because they have, they can understand, you know, uh, they can do models of big ones, and now they can do models of the smaller ones as well. Okay. So there are three key lessons, I would say, that we took away from these newer events, all right? First of all, there's a variety of things that smash into Jupiter. It's not only comets. It's comets and asteroids. It has helped us refine further the physics and chemistry of these large explosions, and the solar system is now <coughs> more dynamic than we even thought, and hence perhaps more dangerous. And what do I mean by dangerous, all right? I'd like to show this to scale. This is about the size of the Pacific Ocean. And you know that, you know, you can say that, but I don't think that really conveys really the enormity of these impacts. So here's a picture of that G impact. Remember, I talked about the G impact? And so one of my colleagues, John Spencer, took that and mapped it to scale onto the planet Earth. And that's what it looks like. This is what we call in the biz a biosphere changing event. <laughs> Another way to phrase that is we would all die if this happened on the Earth. And this was in 1994. Now, maybe these little boys weren't around then, but we all were. This kind of stuff is going on right now, right now in our solar system. Anthony's seen two of them. You know, it's, it's happening, folks. It's real. Oh my God. <laughs> all right. Impacts happen all over the Earth, all the time. And some places look like they have more, Australia. <laughs> but that's just because it's easy to find them, especially in the desert part of Australia, because they just sit there, big holes in the ground. And they are big holes in the ground. This is a crater that is in Arizona. How many of you have ever been there, Meteor Crater, Arizona? I was just there this summer with my kids. And they took them, and we stood on the edge here. You can, can you see the road? It's kind of hard to see. Oh, here's the road coming in. You see the road, you'd stand on the edge, it's a really big hole in the ground. All right, Meteor Crater was formed by a low altitude airburst, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. The kinetic energy that formed this crater, according to people who have modeled it, was about nine megatons. That's a lot of energy. But they think most of it happened in the air. This is not where something hits the ground. Some of it hit the ground, but most of it happened in the air. Okay, there's two kinds of low altitude air bursts. Type one, the explosion creates this fireball that comes down rapidly, but it actually does not hit the ground. The damage on the ground is mechanical, shock waves. Things are knocked over. And it happens from between one and 10 megatons, maybe up to 20 megatons. Happens on time scales of every 100 years or so. The only known example in the recent past is Tunguska. And I'll talk a little bit about Tunguska. There's another type of low-altitude airburst, much bigger, gets all the way to the ground. The damage is caused by thermal damage. In other words, it just like burns everything up. About 10 megatons or above, every thousands of years or so. The best example is Libyan desert glass. All right, so for those of you who like pictures, here's a picture of what I just said. 
Type 1 blows up in the air, type 2 gets to the ground. Both cause a lot of damage. Let's talk about Tunguska. This happened in 1908 in a remote part of Siberia. There were people who actually witnessed it. No people were killed. Some reindeer were killed. It was a massive, massive explosion in the air. As you saw, these are artists' conceptions based on eyewitness accounts of what happened there. 60 years after it happened, people went, teams went, and this is what they saw. Trees knocked down. And they mapped out the pattern of tree fall. And where the red dot is, there were still trees standing, but they had no branches. And all around them, trees were knocked down, radiating away from them. So this is the tree fall pattern at Tunguska. And this is a simulation by Mark Boslow of the actual explosion. And from the shape of the impact, he can predict the angle it came in, the velocity it came in, et cetera. Now, showing pictures like this really doesn't give you a good sense of scale. How about we put it to a local perspective? Canberra. 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 I was coached today. Canberra. All right. There it is. The impact of Tunguska to scale on camera here. Every tree knocked down inside that area. Every structure knocked over inside that area. Now do you feel the oh my god? <laughs> this happened in 1908. Your grandparents were alive when this happened. Thank goodness it happened in a remote part of Siberia. I'd like to show this, part, this next slide. That's Washington, D.C. <laughs> where I work, nation's capital of the United States, and this is to scale. This would do a lot of damage. If this happened today over a populated area, millions of people would die instantly. Right? This happened, fortunately, in an unpopulated area. You scared? Yeah? Right? So we're just talking about the type 1. Let's talk a little bit about type 2. And like I said, the best example is the Libyan, called the Libyan Desert type. And why do you think that is? Imagine, imagine a massive explosion that hits the ground in the desert where temperatures are tens of thousands of degrees, 40,000 degrees. What's going to happen? You're going to get glass. And that's, in fact, what you get. This is a piece of glass found in the Libyan Desert. So this is a sign that there was a massive impact and it was a long time ago. You can tell that by doing the you know, isotopic dating of stuff inside that glass when it happened. And it was a very, very long time ago. All right. But how long is long? All right. Well, here is a little graph that shows you the TNT equivalent in megatons. And then how frequently we expect them to happen. For scale, we put Hiroshima. That was the atomic bomb that the US dropped in Japan. All right. And Events like that happen in the Earth's atmosphere every year. Did you know that? I actually didn't know that until I started hanging out with those people at San Diego National Labs. All <laughs> <laughs> this stuff is oh yeah, there was a there was a you know five megaton explosion over the Pacific Ocean last week. I'm like wow, I didn't know, but it does. It happens all the time. Tunguskas happen roughly every century. Let's do the math. Uh, 1908 <laughs> plus 100, where does that put us? All right, now fortunately, most of the Earth is covered with water. That, so the next Tunguska is likely to happen over water, but who can say? Global catastrophe every million years or so. Libyan desert, maybe a million years ago. <laughs> oh, oh. All right, seriously? I mean, really? Am I just like pulling your leg here? Actually, do we really need to take this seriously? Yes, we do. There's lots of space rocks out there, and the more we look, the more we find. All right, um, we call them near Earth asteroids, near Earth objects, potentially hazardous, whatever name you call them, there's a lot of them out there. These are just some of the uh, rocks that we visited with spacecraft. Um, I'd like to show this plot. This is 400, just 400 of known near-Earth asteroid orbits. All right, every red line is near-Earth asteroid. And we call them near-Earth asteroids because let me show you now, I'm looking down on the solar system, the sun's in the center. Here's the Earth's orbit. 
<laughs> now, there's only 400. We know of thousands of them. There are a lot of things out there, a lot of them. So we're looking for them. Space Guard is a series of small telescopes that the U NASA and the US Air Force has deployed. I've got a real boost after Shoemaker leaving nine. <laughs> Right, when we actually were able to show Congress pictures of devastation real time in the solar system. And so here's a graph of years, 1980s all the way through 2006, and all the near-Earth asteroids are in blue, and the large ones are in red. And gee, 1994, you know, a year or two to get Congress convinced, another year to build your telescopes, and woo, you're finding thousands of objects. When this graph was May 2006, we were up to almost 5,000. Now we're up to over 10,000. Right. None of them are going to hit the Earth. That's good. But this doesn't get us all the way. All right. So we are building other telescopes to actually get all the way. We're trying to get to 90% by the end of this decade. If we build this machine, which is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, um, this telescope will help us get to 99%, including the faintest asteroids. It's a monster data machine, two terabytes per hour, 10 billion objects in real time that it will be observing. And so this is a telescope that we at Aura are working very hard to build, because this is one of the things it's going to do, is look for these things. All right, and it works. Here's an example of one that was discovered in 2008. And an email alert went out to the community. Today, this object was submitted for impact monitoring. Probability of impact is, according to different computations done in slightly different ways, between 99.8 and 100%. In other words, the impact is considered sure and is for tonight. And it was actually seen, the impact was seen by uh, a Dutch pilot who was flying over Africa. Here's a picture of its remnants in the sky over the Sudan. And it was discovered 20 hours before it hit. And so we were able to track it all the way in. And not only were we able to track it all the way in, but using Google, you can actually <laughs> track its path and find out where it went in and make predictions about where the fragments would be. And in fact, they found the pieces. They're all pointing to this piece. They found the pieces of this on the ground. So this process that we have of looking for things that are coming in and collide with the Earth, we actually, it works. It works, and we can find them. So what happens if there's a big one, all right? Well, astronomers put together a scale, kind of like the earthquake scale. They call it the Torino scale. I'm not going to read all these words to you. Let me just say that if you ever hear astronomers say, we found an asteroid with a Torino scale ranking between 8 and 10, Go out, buy a nice bottle of wine, <laughs> find your favorite spot, just enjoy your last dinner party. <laughs> All right? Not likely to happen because we are looking. But what do we do? What do we do if we find one that's going to hit the earth? We have a lot of ideas, actually. There are actually at conferences every year where people get together and say, what are we going to do if we find an asteroid that has earth written on it? Okay? So we know we have different ideas. Some people say, well, let's put a gravity tractor, you set a spacecraft right next to this thing. Now, this takes years, so you have to find your asteroid like 30 years before it's going to hit the Earth, which we can do, because we can integrate their orbits very, very well. And you set it there, and the gravity of your spacecraft just very, very slowly pulls this thing off course. And if you do it 30 years ahead of time, you don't have to move it very far. It'll miss the Earth. Um, some people have an idea to use a kinetic impactor, where it, you, you sort of push it like with an explosion. If you find this object coming in, you only have 60 days, all right? This not, none of these are going to work, all right? You're going to have to do the Bruce Willis kind of thing, <laughs> you know, that, that's just where you ride up there and you set off a nuclear bomb, which is kind of dumb, because let's think about it. you got this giant rock coming in, heading towards Earth, and then you blow it up, what do you got? A whole lot of rocks coming in here. The thinking goes that, you know, maybe some of them will miss, Maybe hit your enemies instead of you. I don't know. <laughs> it's not a very good idea. Actually, this is the one I like the best. Actually, if you find this thing 20, 30 years out, you set up some kind of a big deployable mirror and you shine sunlight on it. And you use that to create what we call non-gravitational forces. In other words, you make little jets of water that 
come off this thing. And why restrict yourselves to one? People come to this whole mirror beam thing. We swarm this thing with sunlight. This is just focused sunlight and push it off its course. I'm just giving you some ideas. There are people who actually say jobs do this kind of thing. I'm just sharing it with you. But the bottom line is that we are looking for these things and we do have ideas on how to deflect them should we find one that's coming in. But let's do a reality check first. Okay. What hazards do you worry about? Do you worry about anything? What are you afraid of dying from? Yeah. <laughs> huh? Car accidents. Car accidents? Yeah. Anything else? Disease. Diseases? Yeah. Plane accidents? Absolutely. Nuclear war. Nuclear war. Sure. Lots of things. Uh, some people worry about lightning. Get struck by lightning. Those people. Yeah. Sharks. Always a big topic in the news. Shark kills people. Does that happen in Australia? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Just check. All right. Airplane crashes, like someone said already. Uh, terror, <coughs> terrorism in the U.S. Big, big deal right now. Ever since 9/11, um, I worry about elevators. <laughs> it's my own personal thing. We all have our personal hangups. We as elevators, smoking, big killer of people around the world. Car accidents, like we said, obesity. There's a big killer. Diseases. So those are the things that we really, let's put that into context now. Um, Clark Chapman and Dave Morrison actually put together a list back after Shoemaker League 9 of what US citizens actually died from, all right? So this is US centric, but I'm sure it's not that dissimilar in Australia. And here's their list. Number one, motor vehicle accidents. That's what you're likely to die from in the United States. Murder, fire, firearms. Then comes the comet asteroid impact. Now, the reason this probability is so high is because if it hits, it kills a lot of people, a whole lot of people. And so that's why on this list it's high, right? Um, and there's actually a range. There's the lower limit and the upper limit. So you see there's a range there. And there's things like air, aircraft, tornadoes, floods. We didn't have a lot of that in the United States, you know, floods. Um, then it spikes, it stings. I hear that's more of an issue here in Australia. We might have to might be up to the top. Yeah, it might be up the top for you guys, all right? Um, and then fireworks, ac accidents, poisoning, all this kind of stuff. All right, so this was, um, oh, terrorism. In 94, when this chart was made, it wasn't on the list, but it comes in right about there now in the United States. Uh, so that was the range in 1994. Since the space guard went up, that range has dropped because we've discovered things and we've ruled out a lot of probability of impacts. It's dropped by 2000 and it dropped to here. 2005, it had dropped further. 2010, we're down to here. So as of now, you're far more likely to die of a, a plane crash or in the United States, a venomous thing, than you are from a comet impact. That's good news. So, you know, we're, we're on top of this situation. So let me wrap it up for you here. There's a lot of science enabled by these Jupiter impacts, and I've talked about that. Tracking a wind in the atmosphere. Um, studying things about the planet, studying things about the population of objects in the solar system. But there's other takeaway lessons that I want you to leave here knowing. And one of them is that there's a very important role today for amateur astronomers in studying the universe. I'm just talking about comet crashes here. But there are other observations that amateur astronomers make. They are studying, you know, uh, supernovae. The supernovae are typically found by amateurs who are out looking for Things. And then the astronomer, professional astronomers like me, use the really big telescopes to follow up. Um, looking for planets around other stars. A lot of that work is being done by amateurs now. And then we do follow up work. So we've really changed a lot in how we do astronomy now. Um, it used to be that you know, the professional astronomers would just do their work. Now it's much more of a synergy between the amateur community and the professional community. And I think that's a great thing. And I want to encourage that. Second of all, the solar system is much more dynamic and dangerous than we thought, but let's be sensible about it, right? As we just went through, you know, I have insurance. I have, you know, insurance on my house. I have insurance for my car. I have health insurance. I do not have comet impact insurance. <laughs> it's just not something that I worry about on a day-to-day -day basis, and you shouldn't either. What you should do when you go home from this talk today really take care of yourself and be safe is to buckle up.
<laughs> to drive home safely. Thank you very much. such a big, it was so obvious. I mean, how many of you looked through a little telescope and saw the black spots on Jupiter? I mean, it, it just was so easy to see. Um, we actually had a program going in the 80s, 70s and 80s, called Planetary Control, <coughs> where we had four telescopes, 24 inch telescopes, spaced around the world. And they were doing imaging of Jupiter and other planets. And Clark Chapman went through them and looked at all the images and didn't find anything like Shoemaker V9. Now he may have missed something like the 2009 event. He may have missed that. But he says no. He says he looked very carefully. Now the quality of the images that we had was not as good as what Anthony is doing now. I mean, and it's kind of stuff that Anthony is doing with the very high speed imaging with, with electronic cameras is much better quality than the photographic work that we were doing in the 70s and 80s. So it's possible we missed something. And there's another very intriguing story which is hotly debated in the astronomy community. But Cassini, the astronomer, not the spacecraft, Cassini himself in the 1600s, in his sketchbook, he showed a dark spot that evolved over a period of weeks, and it looked a whole lot like Shoemaker Levy 9. It was dark, and then it spread out. Remember the picture I showed where it kind of spread out of time? Just like that. There are people that say, no, nah, it couldn't possibly be, but it sure looks like that. So the answer is, uh, you know, we look, we haven't found any obvious traces in the data that we have, but it's not as good as the data that people are getting today. And so really, I think the way we do this is we have to go forward and encourage our amateurs to keep looking so we can build up better statistics. Well, how big do you have to be to make a spot that's noticeable? How big an impact? Um, that one, the, we think that the one that Anthony found was, I think, 300 meters across, just something not very big. But they're moving very fast, so they make big explosions. Other questions? Yes. What's causing the explosion? Because for explosions, you need fuel, I mean, oxygen to, to react with the fuel. But what, when? Oh, I love this question. Yeah. yeah, come up here, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, need, I need a person to demonstrate. <laughs> Addy. Addy? Yeah. OK, Addy. All right, so do you swim? A bit, yeah. OK, so imagine Addy goes to swim in the water. OK, so you just step into it, what happens to you? Float. You float, because you know how to swim, right? So now, have you ever done a high dive? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Miserable fail. Yeah, miserable fail. Did you land on your stomach? Ow! <laughs> Ow! All right, so you know that that, that hurts, all right? Now, I want you to imagine, Addy, that you have been thrown out of an airplane sure. without a parachute. <laughs> <laughs> and you land in the pool of balance. I hit it. How hard did you hit it? Very hard. Yeah. Very it's very deep. Yeah, bad. It's very bad. Okay. That's a bad thing. Now, Abby, I'd like to imagine you coming in from outer space with a velocity of 137,000 miles per hour. <laughs> and then you can pull what happens after. I explode the body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's basically that's what happens. Now, the pool is still liquid water, right? And you're still a guy who hits the pool. But it's the, it's the velocity that you're hitting the pool with. And the atmosphere of Jupiter here is the same thing. Although it's a gas, when you, if you hit Jupiter, going 137,000 miles an hour, when you hit that atmosphere, that's enough to cause a massive explosion. But that's going to shatter me, right? Not explode as in a fireball. Hey, what really happens here? We just don't know. Thank you. <laughs> what happens, this is what the guys at San Diego do the models. What really happens is this fragment's coming in, all right? coming in and it drills a hole and it creates a superheated column that's going so fast that it superheats this gases as it's going in. And the temperatures get up to 40,000 degrees. 
of superheated gases, all right? And when a gas is heated to 40,000 degrees, what does it do? It expands. And where is it going to expand into? Well, the surrounding atmosphere maybe, but in fact, the best place is the superheated column that's just been evacuated by the fragment coming in. So that's why the things come in at this angle, but then they jet back out the path of entry and form these monstrous plumes, thousands of miles high, of superheated gases. And it's those superheated gases that then collapse down and make the black stuff. It's basically soot. So it's not so much that there's oxygen there, but it's superheated gases that are just jetting out of the atmosphere. Other questions? Yes? Yeah, you were mentioning the Tunguska um, explosion in, in 1908 as a sort of once in a century type of event. I hope they're not more common than that. But I was reading fairly recently um, about impacts um, in 1930 and 1935, both in South America. I don't know if you've heard anything much about them. Apparently, there was one in the Amazon Valley and one up in Guyana. Uh, one's somewhat smaller, but another substantially larger, apparently, in Tunguska. Do you know anything? I don't know anything about that, but I'm not surprised. As I said, you know, the people who monitor these things say these kinds of things do happen fairly frequently. And so um, in remote parts of the country, uh, at times when we didn't have instant communication everywhere like we do now, I can easily imagine a massive explosion occurs and nobody knows. Nowadays, we all know. You know, if Lady Gaga blows her nose, we all know it everywhere in the world. So if there's a massive, you know, 50 kiloton explosion, everybody knows. But 30 years ago, that wasn't the case. 30 years, you could have a massive explosion. And if it didn't happen over Washington, D.C., or London, or Canberra, then you wouldn't know about it. What decides whether an impact is going to explode in the air, or park in the air, or in the ground? as in the uh, meteorite crater, yes. as in Tangosa. Yeah, so the question is, what determines whether or not an object will make it all the way to the ground and create an explosion there, or whether it burns up in the atmosphere? And it's a combination of factors. The most important, there's two main factors. One is the size of the body, all right? Big ones are going to make it further than small ones. The shooting stars that we've all seen are typically the size of a pea, and they just burn up in the atmosphere. Things that are the size of, um, gosh, I don't know what you'd use here. In America, I would have said a basketball. The basketball, <laughs> bowling balls, I don't know what you, I don't know what the sports are in Australia. Things that are this big typically will make it to the ground. Right? They won't cause craters like Meteor Crater. The thing that caused Meteor Crater was probably the size you know, of a, of a giant bus or something like that. Big, really big. And it's not just size, though. It's also the strength of the body. There's different kinds of things flying around in outer space. Some asteroids are very hard. They're iron nickel. They're, they're metal. They're chunks of metal. And they are formed in the inside of planetary bodies, like when they formed. And those things, they're so strong, they will get all the way to the surface of the Earth, even if they're only this big, because they're metals. But then there are other kinds of asteroids and comets that are, are stones, rocks, or in the case of comets, ice. And those things tend to break up higher in the atmosphere, even if they're larger. So it's a combination of the size of the body and the density or tensile strength of the body and it's a complicated interplay between those two that keeps the guys at Sandia National Labs very busy doing atmospheric modeling. That answers the question. Yes? Given the relative frequency of this, um, what danger would be of an impact looking like a, a nuclear attack? And Good. unleash your nuclear arm again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how, you know, how would you distinguish between a nuclear bomb, you know, or above ground testing and, and uh, one of these impacts. Well, the answer is uh, nowadays they're monitoring all the time. And I, I didn't know this either until I started hanging out with these guys. But they, they have satellites up there that are monitoring all of the Earth. And they can tell the difference between a nuclear explosion and one of these explosions primarily by the colors and the intensities and also by the fact that there's always you know, some kind of an incoming, you could see it coming in. So people are watching very carefully. 
it's they have they have their ways. <laughs> they don't share with the likes of me. Because that would be you know violating national security things. But they, they know how to talk to they. The US military, the Australian military, I'm sure they know how to talk the difference between them. And not to mention radiation. Yeah. You all know about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've seen impacts on Jupiter. But what about Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune? What does the modeling say about whether we should see impact on them? The models say that Saturn, it should be possible if there are big events like we saw on Jupiter, that we should be able to detect them on Saturn. Uranus and Neptune are too far. We would not, even when, even if they would give me Hubble to use every night <laughs> to look at Neptune, which they won't, because they would look at galaxies and stars and all sorts of other things. But even if they gave me, it wouldn't be enough. You couldn't, you couldn't detect these impacts. Um, Jupiter is a big gravity well. It's a big planet, and so it tends to, it's like what well, we say in America, it's the broad side of the barn. It's easy to hit. It's got a big gravitational field that pulls in these comets and things. So it's more probable that Jupiter will be hit than Saturn. But there are people who think that we could see a Saturn impact should one occur, so keep looking. Now, it's interesting, though. There is circumstantial evidence that these impacts do go on in the outer solar system. And in the case of Neptune, it's actually the carbon monoxide content of the atmosphere we look at. We can actually detect that in the atmosphere of Neptune. And there have been raging debates about whether it's somehow coming, it's internally generated, uh, endogenic, we call that, or whether it's exogenic, coming in from the outside. And that debate was going on for a whole long time in the literature. And then after SL9, people really started thinking, hmm, this really could be comets and other material in the outer solar system going into Neptune's atmosphere causing that chemical change. And so one of the signatures we'll be looking for is if one day suddenly there's much stronger detection of some carbon-bearing species in Neptune's atmosphere, that will be a clue something may have hit it. So that's the kind of thing we keep our eyes out for. So far, we don't have that, but it's a possibility. It's a possible way to detect it.